I'm going to try and speak as loud as Sean. It's going to be hard, actually. <laughs> but uh, I'm actually from Texas as well, so you have a lot of Texan speakers here. Uh, my mother's French. Uh, my father's from Corpus Christi. Uh, Corpus Christi, the body of Christ, a uh, city in the south of Texas. Uh, we refer to it as God's country, uh, the body of Christ. But uh, now we live in Paris. Uh, before that, uh, we lived in Rome. And uh, I actually met my wife in Istanbul. Uh, she was studying here in England uh, at university. And uh, we were there for a United Nations conference. And uh, so we've started off as a pro-life couple and we've stayed all the way through. So today, I think I'm just going to start with um, the first question, right? Why do pro-lifers focus on abortion? And I was, I was touring around in India. I was giving a lot of pro-life talks in India. And questions came up from the audience, repeated questions. Why doesn't Human Life International talk about drug abuse? Why aren't you involved in trying to end wars? Why aren't you trying to do, and they named all these different social problems that take human lives. And they said, you know, you're pro-life. Why are you telling us about abortion? And I said, you know, that's a fair question. We don't identify as anti-abortion. We identify as pro-life. So why is it that we end up speaking about abortion so much? And as in you know, all good questions, there's a good answer. Uh, when you're trying to save lives, you have to prioritize. And there is nothing in this world that takes as many lives as abortion. How many people died of abortion last year? Who here in the audience knows? Best guess. Ah, uh, keep guessing, keep guessing. In the world. In the world. Worldwide, how many abortions last year? Correct answer. Correct answer. Over 40 million abortions last year worldwide. And of course, a lot of this is estimated. We don't know for sure because a lot of abortions don't go recorded. A lot of abortions happen illegally in different countries. So we're just estimating here. 40 million. Do you know what the leading cause of death, the leading cause of death after abortion is worldwide? Heart disease. 7.4 million people died worldwide of heart disease, and that was the leading cause of death last year, except for abortion. In the United States, 600,000 people died of heart disease. A million people died of abortion. In England and Wales, Last year, over 60,000 people, again, leading cause of death was heart disease. Over 60,000 people died. In 2014, 184,000 people died in England and Wales of abortion. Now, when I was looking at the statistics, I was quite surprised because there was England and Wales and then Scotland. And Scotland is, seems not in the same country almost. Uh, but the, the statistics are kept separately. It's interesting to see. We have to prioritize, I mean, where are people dying? I mean, what is, what is the number one problem today in terms of who's being killed? If you're truly pro-life, where are you going to go to save the most lives? And abortion just wins, hand down. Now, how many people have died in the entire AIDS pandemic? Since the very beginning of the AIDS pandemic to the present, how many people have died? Best guess. 39 million people. So from the 19, over three decades of AIDS, one of the worst epidemics in the history of the world, 39 million people have died. And it's horrific, and people are mobilized to put an end to the AIDS pandemic, and they should be. But that's less than one year's casualties of abortion. So, you know, we're really talking about something on a different scale here, why we're being pro-life. And if you go back to 1966, to the present, so 50 years, how many people have died abortion worldwide? Over 40 million a year. We're talking about 2 billion people. 2 billion people in the last 50 years. And the problem is continuing. Every year it continues. I mean, fortunately, abortion rates are going down. And, and one of the good news about the pro-life movement in the United States and in other countries is that pro-lifers are managing to save more and more lives. There was a time when there were 1.6 million abortions in America. It's been reduced to 1 million a year. It's still a million abortions a year, but it's almost one-third less than it was. And that's largely because of the pro-life movement. 
but there's a lot of work still to be done. So when we're asked, you know, why do we focus on abortion when we're pro-lifers, there's your answer. It's a very clear, it's a very simple answer. And it's also curious, I find, that pro-lifers are almost the only ones who are asked to solve every single problem in the world. So I don't know of any people who are animal rights campaigners, who are fighting to save the great apes in Africa, who get taken to task for not fighting whaling. <laughs> no, people don't say, you're fighting for the great apes, then you don't have to deal with the whales. You know, someone else will do that. But pro-lifers in the United States, for instance, are very criticized because they're not fighting the death penalty enough. Or they're not fighting to save uh, you know, people from smoking or, or drunk driving or all kinds of other things. In the United States, last year, there were 28 executions. There were a million abortions. If one were to, to spend the same amount of time fighting the death penalty as one spent fighting abortion, the results would not be what they are. So it's a very important thing. It's really a red herring argument. And I would say that globally, if you look at it, globally about 20% of established pregnancies end in abortion. To go to a period in history where we had that high of a mortality, you have to go back to the 14th century, to the Black Death, to the bubonic plague, which wiped out 30% of the population. But since the 14th century, there's been nothing comparable in terms of mortality. 20%. So, as I'm you know, talking to you, I'm giving you a lot of statistics. And one of, one of my purposes, really, is to tell you to watch out about statistics. There's that old proverb, you know, there are lies, there are damned lies, and then there are statistics. <laughs> I think it's actually a British proverb. Uh, and it's very, very applicable to abortion. Those who favor abortion tell lies with statistics all the time. And you have to watch the sources. You have to go to the sources and see. For instance, in the 1960s and 1970s, Dr. Bernard Nathanson, who was an abortionist, and he was actually the head of NARAL. At that time, NARAL it changed names multiple times in its, in its history. But at that time, it was called the National Association for the Repeal of Abortion Laws. And in the 60s and 70s, as he was pushing for legalized abortion, he and the other leaders said 10 thousand women a year were dying of illegal abortion. 10,000 women a year. And that was picked up in the media and it was used to batter and batter and batter. We need to legalize abortion because 10,000 women a year are dying. And he knew, and the other leaders knew, that the actual statistic was between 200 and 250. And when he converted to the pro-life cause, he said, you know, I was lying. But it was a useful figure, and the media used it, and we kind of scared people into legalizing abortion, and that was a good statistic to use. But it was completely fraudulent, and he lied about many things like that. In the 1990s, actually, at the conference where I met my wife, there was a press conference, and they talked about mortality from unsafe, illegal abortion. And someone came up with this enormous statistic, I think it was 500,000 women a year dying worldwide of unsafe, illegal abortions, and why we had to legalize abortion around the world. And they were lying, and they made a very big mistake. They actually broke the number down by country. So, so many women died in this country, so many women died in that country. And they gave a figure for Venezuela. And there was a Venezuelan activist who was there, who took the number that they were presenting as died of unsafe, illegal abortion in Venezuela for this year. And she got this statistic for how many women had died in Venezuela between the ages of 15 and 45, from all causes combined, from cancer and heart attack, all causes. And that figure was lower than the number they were printing, dying from unsafe illegal abortion in Venezuela. So, you know, they were just inventing things and they were trying just to scare people into legalizing abortion. And, and so we have to be careful. We have to be careful of these lies and, and call them on it because the media generally will not. So, as we're looking at all these things, abortion today is often presented as a women's issue, as a question of choice, even as a human right. Now, 
this is all clever marketing. As Sean was saying, it's a distraction, okay, to distract us from the atrocious reality of baby killing. There are bumper stickers, car bumper stickers that you see in America that say, against abortion, don't have one. And that's a slogan that's used. Now, fill in the blanks with any other cause. Against killing baby seals, don't club one. It's ridiculous. And they get away with the most strange slogans and, and the weirdest statistics. So we really have to call them on their lies. And the most commonly used slogan for the pro-abortion movement is pro-choice. And they say that we are in favor of choice. And it makes it sound like they're a bunch of calm and dispassionate people who respect women's choices and that are offering them all these different options. And finally, uh, it distracts from the fact that these people are actually rabidly pushing abortion. But they claim to be pro-choice. So if we look at pro-choicers, why do pro-choicers fight? They fight when we want to provide information about the medical and psychological risks of abortion. If we want to help people to know, to make an informed choice. If we want to pass a law for a waiting period, that you have to wait and, and think a little bit before having the abortion, to make a better choice, the pro-choicers against this. And my personal favorite, the pro-choice movement is against doctors being able to choose whether or not to perform an abortion. You had the case here in the UK of the Scottish midwives who didn't want to be involved in abortion. And they were told, no, you're going to have to be involved. It went all the way up to the British Supreme Court. And the pro-choice side does not want to give medical personnel a choice on abortion. So pro-choice really is a lie. They're not really pro-choice, they're pro-abortion. In fact, pro-lifers, when a woman comes thinking about abortion, they offer her many more choices. Whether she wants to choose adoption, whether she wants to be helped in different ways, all kinds of different choices and possibilities. When they go to an abortion center, they're given one choice. It's very, very sad. And the thing that struck me the most, actually, was a study by David Reardon. In the United States, David Reardon did something that I think we can all agree with. He says, I can talk about abortion, you can talk about abortion, but no one can talk about abortion like a person who's had one. Let's ask them. What was their experience? So he did a survey. He talked to women who had abortions and he asked them, what was it, well, why did you have an abortion? And 64% of the women he surveyed said, I had that abortion because I was pressured into having it. My parents, my boyfriend, my colleagues, the doctor, somebody was pressuring them to have the abortion. It wasn't my free choice. I was being pressured into doing this. And 84% said they felt they didn't have enough information to make an informed choice. So here we are. We have a paradox. We have the abortion rights movement calling itself pro-choice, and the women having the abortions, the actual women having the abortions saying, I felt that I didn't have a choice. I felt that I was being pressured against what I wanted to do. I wasn't given the information. I didn't know what was going to happen, etc. So pro-choice, you can really say, is a lie. For more information on this topic, you can go to Reardon's website. It's wonderful. He's got so much information on there. It talks about rape and incest, women who, who had abortions after suffering rape and incest, and what was their experience. And it was very pro-life. A hundred percent of the women who were raped, who chose life, said that they made the right choice. 75% of the women who were conceived in rape and had an abortion said, you know, I regret having had that abortion. So, you know, we can talk all we want about what's right and wrong. We should actually talk to the women. We should ask them what their experience was. It's very, very important. So the websites he's got, one is called afterabortion.org. The other one is called theunchoice.com. It's Dr. David Reardon. He's very, very good. He's constantly publishing new and interesting things. And, um, and we just have to... Yes, absolutely. The afterabortion.org and the unchoice.com. And afterwards, anyone can come up to me if you didn't get that down. Um, the other, other lie is pro-woman. 
that the abortion movement is pro-woman is a complete and utter fabrication. And I have the proof of this. Who here is familiar with sex selection abortion? We've heard about sex selection abortion. And what is sex selection abortion? It's when the father or the mother or both discover the sex of their child before the child is born, and they decide they don't want to have a child of that particular sex. And in the real world, the world we live in, most of the time it's a baby girl that is being sex selectively aborted. There have been over 100 million little girls aborted because they were female. Because the parents did not want to have a baby girl. Now, if that is not discrimination against women of the worst possible kind, I defy you to give me a better example of worst discrimination against women. And the pro-woman organizations, the pro-abortion organizations, most of them do not fight sex selection abortion. In the United States, when they were passing laws against sex selection abortion, Planned Parenthood, oh, we're against that. All these feminists, we're against that. Okay, so which side are you on? The side of the girls, the side of the women, or are you on the side of the abortions? You're not pro-woman, you are pro-abortion. And if you look at the, the statistics around the world, it is incredible. And the United Nations is doing practically nothing about this. I mean, there are a few voices. There are a few voices, thank God, a few voices from the feminist movement and other places, but they're rare. One of them said, it's the slaughter of Eve a systematic gender side of tragic proportions. And it's true. There's a global attack, if you will, on baby girls. And it's particularly centered in Asia. Uh, sadly, uh, in China, for instance, they have certain provinces, the major provinces like Guangdong and Hainan, where they have as many as 130, 135 boys for every 100 girls at birth because the baby girls have been aborted. Uh, the Lancet estimates that between 1986 and 2006, there were 10 million sex selection abortions of baby girls in India alone. And so this problem is all over the world, and I could talk on and on. I could give a whole talk on this. But my point here is that the pro-abortion side is not pro-woman. Until they come out and say, we are against self sex selection abortion, we want to pass a law in Britain banning sex selection abortion. And you say, ah, okay, now you're wanting to defend some women. That's a good thing. Uh, some feminists do come against it, but the vast majority say that they believe that the right of abortion is more important than the right of baby girls to be born. And that is a tragedy. Let's take a little historical look at abortion. I, actually, my, my first degrees were in, in history, and I, I love history. Uh, did you know that some of the first medical instruments that were discovered by archaeologists were curettes for performing abortion, over 2,000 years old. And we all know, you know, the Hippocratic Oath, the medical oath, that is against both abortion and euthanasia. But we have to remind ourselves that oath was made in the 5th century BC. So abortion was already a problem. Euthanasia was already a problem in the 5th century before Christ. It's not a new problem. And clearly, it's something that has happened for centuries and millennia, and it's going to continue. But what happened in the intervening years? The culture was pro-life, <coughs> and, and specifically Judeo-Christianity. One of the, the nicknames, you know, one of the, the, the names that was used for the Jews in the ancient world, in the ancient Mediterranean, was the people that does not abort. And the early Christians were actually famous for going and rescuing children that had been left out to die by the pagans. And, and when the culture became more and more Christian, uh, abortion went down and went down and went down, such that there was no country that had legal abortion until the 20th century. So which country legalized abortion? What was the first country to legalize abortion in the 20th century? Soviet uh, no, the Soviet Union. Very good. All right, we've got an informed audience. I love it. Uh, 1920. 1920, Vladimir Lenin, just after the, the, the Soviet Revolution, 
He legalized abortion, and why did he do it? He said he wanted to create the new Soviet, the new socialist man, the new socialist woman, and to destroy the institution of the family. And he thought abortion was an excellent way to do that, to create a new society that was based on socialism, Marxism, rather than Christianity. And so he saw abortion as a key instrument there. What was the second country to legalize abortion in the 20th century? I think I heard it. Nazi Germany, 1935. 1935, uh, the German regime legalizes abortion for racial hygiene and eugenics. And I actually, I read a very interesting article. It was in um, the Israeli Medical Association Journal entitled Doctors, Pregnancy, Childbirth and Abortion During the Third Reich. And the author highlights how abortion and sterilization were used as instruments of the Nazi genocide. So in the occupied territories, particularly in Poland, abortion was being pushed as a means of getting rid of the people that the Nazis didn't want. All right, so we're looking at the origins of legal abortion in the modern era. The two most despicable ideologies of the 20th century, communism and Nazism. And that's the origin of legalized abortion. Not women's rights, not pro-woman, not human rights. In fact, the communist Chinese from 1978 to 2015 had the one-child policy. How many here are familiar with the one-child policy? The one-child policy, a lot of people, when I was visiting in China, a lot of people said, you know, they, they didn't realize what the one-child policy was. A lot of people thought you could have one child. That was not the one-child policy. The one-child policy is you could have one child after the government gave you permission. So what would happen is your village or your factory would have so many permissions to have a child, and you would petition to have a child, your one child, and they would give you permission. And once you had that permission, then you could have a child. If you were illegally pregnant, because you didn't have a permission yet, even if it was your first child, they would force you to have an abortion. Now today, they've decided to change it to a two-child policy because their dem demography is caught up with them, but they're still requiring you to get permission from the government before you can actually conceive a child, even your first child. So, I mean, think about how intrusive that is. And, and the pro-choice movement Right? The pro-abortion movement has given awards, awards to the Chinese Family Planning Agency for their heroic work, their human rights abuses. And you know, this, is, this is what we're looking at. So what happened after that? Right? What happened after the Nazis? What happened after the communists? Well, we had the feminists, Margaret Sanger, the foundress of Planned Parenthood, of course, the International Planned Parenthood Federation is based here in London. It's the largest global network of pro-abortion, abortion-promoting organizations around the world. Well, who was Margaret Sanger? She was a bigot. She was a racist. She was a eugenicist. She was a very despicable human being. I mean, here's one of her quotations. We should hire three or four colored ministers preferably with social service backgrounds and with engaging personalities. The most successful educational approach to the Negro is through a religious appeal. We don't want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. And, and the numbers speak for themselves. In the United States, 11% of women are black. 33% of abortions are on black women. I looked at the numbers for England and Wales. There are 8% of abortions in England and Wales in 2014 were on black or black British women, while they represented 3.3% of the population. So double their percentage of the population in terms of abortion. And Marie Stopes, sort of uh, the UK's Margaret Sanger, you know, she actually wrote a letter to Adolf Hitler in 1939 gushing about how wonderful he was. 
In 1939, she attended one of his eugenics conferences in 1935. And of course, Marie Stopes clinics exist all over the UK and now in over 30 countries. But this is the origin of the modern abortion movement. Nazis, communists, and these racist ladies. And, and you know, they even made a stamp to Marie Stopes here in the UK in 2010 as, as this great hero, this great icon. Now, we have to, we have to know this history just to, to show how wrong these people are. And they have a lot of these similar skeletons in their closets. As Sean was saying, you know, Planned Parenthood in the United States was just, was just caught red-handed selling the, the organs of the children that they had aborted. You know, and these people have no scruples, no scruples whatsoever. They are literally out there to make a buck. And, and hopefully, they're hoping to get rid of those people that they don't like. There was actually an abortionist in the United States who said, I would do abortions for free if I could be assured that all the people coming for the abortions would be minority populations. You know, so there's, there's a real racism involved in the whole abortion movement. <coughs> so why am I part of the pro-life movement? Why should you be part of the pro-life movement? So that's kind of a question we should all ask ourselves. I firmly believe in every generation, there is one cause, one cause that stands out from the others. If you were living in the early 19th century in Britain, and you were not supporting the anti-slave trade movement and William Wilberforce, you literally had missed the boat. You had missed the historical cause that was the most important cause of that time. The founder of Human Life International went to go meet St. John Paul II. And John Paul II said, you are doing the most important work on earth. The pro-life work is the most important work on earth. I think today it's hard to make a case for any other movement that is the most important movement to be involved in. And I would say as well, you know, this famous quote from Mother Teresa, she actually said this in front of U.S. President Bill Clinton in 1994. It's such a wonderful quote. It's one of my favorites. I feel that the greatest destroyer of peace today is abortion because it is a war against the child, a direct killing of an innocent child, murder by the mother herself. And if we can accept, if we can accept that a mother can have her child killed, how can we tell anyone else, anyone else, not to kill anyone? I mean, if a mother is allowed to kill her child, what's a stranger, you know? It, it, it really does have a corrosive effect on societal morality. It's a powerful, powerful witness there. And I'm personally very hopeful, very hopeful for the cause of life. I mean, I've traveled all over the world, and I've met so many pro-lifers, and there's a dynamism right now. There's a lot of, I mean, the other side, make no, you know, no joke, they are very active, and they're pushing very hard, and they have a huge amount of money. But there's so many people who are waking up. They're waking up to the culture of death, to what it is, and why we have to stand up for it, and why we have to stand up for the family. And, um, you know, if you look around the world, there are, 117 countries and territories that are below replacement fertility. 117 out of 224. A majority of the world's population live in countries that are not having enough children just to replace themselves. Less than 2.1 children per woman. And in fact, uh, the, the world fertility rate is about 2.36. And it's been falling since 1950. Some demographers are saying that the world the entire world will be below replacement in just nine years, in 2025. And that world population will peak at about 8.7 billion and start declining in 2025. But the real question is, who is having children? Who is having children? And actually in the United States, they did a census, we do a census every 10 years, they did a census and it revealed that the liberal parts of America were having very few children. And the conservative parts of America were having lots of children. And in Seattle, in the Pacific Northwest, which is quite a liberal area, they found that the average household had 45% more dogs, 
dogs than children. And, and you do. In the United States, you sometimes get Christmas cards from people, and you've got the husband and the wife and the dog and the cat. And that's the family. Uh, and, and unfortunately, liberal America is very much in that model, you know, one child or no child. And in a place like Salt Lake City, they had 19% more kids than dogs. So you can, you know, there's even a term for it. The demographer Philip Longman refers to it as the liberal baby bust. Uh, literally, liberals and pro-aborts, etc., have so few children that they're literally dying out. Uh, in the USA, 47% of people who attend church weekly, whatever church they attend, say their ideal family size is three or more children. Only 27% of those who seldom attend church want that many children. So clearly, I mean, those who follow the biblical injunction, right, be fertile and multiply, uh, will inherit the earth. And uh, those who embrace abortion and an anti-child mentality are literally dooming themselves to extinction. In the U.S., in the state of Oregon, there's actually a movement. It's called the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement. And it's, a, as you can imagine, it's a pretty liberal movement. And uh, the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement, their motto is, may we live long and die out. And the idea is to leave the earth to the other animals, you know, to, to inherit the earth, etc. But clearly that is a philosophy that has very little future to it. <laughs> so here's a challenge for all of us, right? 83%. 83% of abortive mothers in one survey said, I would not have gone through with that abortion if one person among my friends or family had said not to go through with it. And that has to be a challenge for us. You know, we have to be that pro-life witness to the people around us, to our friends, to our family, to our colleagues. We can literally save lives. We can all become heroes just by standing up. And 40 Days for Life is one of the beautiful ways that you can do this. Let me tell you a story about a family friend of ours. Her name is Christina. And Christina grew up in the culture. She didn't know very much about the pro-life side. She just heard what the media was talking about, etc. And she decided that she was pro-choice. She decided that she was in favor of legalized abortion. And she ran into my sister, who's a rather forceful personality, and they had a strong debate. And it was the first time the pro-life side had really been presented to Christina. But she was moved. And so she went and studied in depth, and she became convinced that the right to life was a real right, and that abortion should not be allowed. And so she became a strong pro-lifer. She went to university. She arrived at the university, and there was no pro-life club, no pro-life student group. So she started the pro-life club right there at her university. And every year they have a, a session where you have a little table for all the different clubs and associations. I think in the UK they call it like a fresher's fair or something. Yeah. So they do something similar in the US. And so she had her table, she had her pro-life information, she had a sign-up sheet, everything was great. She signed up people, she started the club, but nothing dramatic happened. The second year she comes back again. She's got her table, information, and a young lady walks up and says, I want to thank you. And she's like, oh, great. Well, she says, well, last year I came here, I, I saw your information. And then she pulled out a picture and she said, this is a picture of my daughter, Bianca. And she's alive today because you were there. And she had literally saved a human life by standing at a table with a little bit of it. She hadn't even talked to this woman. It was just her silent witness that had saved a human life. And I put it to you that all of us can do something similar. So I thank you so much for coming here. I thank you especially for what you're going to do in the future. God bless you.